Hi guys, Craig here from Arms and Armor. Today we're going to take a little bit of time and talk to some of the questions we got when we did our Hungarian Spotlight video. When we do the videos, sometimes it's just to highlight the piece and talk a little bit about the story of the item, how we came about to make it, uh, some interesting aspects about it, those kind of things. And sometimes we'll mention things real quickly or in passing that are deep concepts or uh, complex issues in medieval sword scholarship. And sometimes it's good to um, answer those questions, which we got from the video, in ways that allow us to expand on our knowledge of what it is to be a medieval sword and how those things evolved in time. When we look at this, this particular sword and the question we had, there was an interest in being able to be used in a, as a single hand or two handed grip. And the question from the very astute watcher was, well, is it better for thrusting or striking? The answer to that question is very complex and there isn't a simple answer. Some swords definitely are for thrusting. Other swords are combinations or cut and thrust weapons. Other swords are very much designed for the type of sword that is a cutter, but in today's ideas of the medieval sword, sometimes these get way overemphasized. Uh, it, it's one of those things that some very astute individuals studying history and the scholarship of weapons and their use will often say is that we get so wrapped up in is this thing better than that that the logistics and structure of how they were used and when they were used and how was it a how were they able to be used uh, gets lost completely and looking at the hungarian sword that's a little bit of what's going on here uh, it definitely is a single-handed sword when you have this sword in hand and you go to strike with it, it works very well. It's got a blade that is designed to be very effective in the cut. It's wide, it's got a nice uh, angle to it, sharp edges, the tip comes and it's sharp, it's got a point, but it comes into a slightly rounded tip. Now, that is not something that is difficult to thrust with, especially against a human uh, shaped target that has a modicum of, of defenses to it, whether cloth or what have you. Um, now, if it gets being used against male armor, then we do see that, you know, the thrust of a sword can penetrate mail, but it is the kind of thing that happens with a particular uh, very stiff blade. This blade would probably be challenged a bit by mail to just thrust through it, but it is very likely that it could happen. When we see these swords depicted in the art of the period, this is exactly what we sometimes see. Now, when we talk about it being not only a cut or a thrust sword, you see this extra length of grip here. This is designed just from the original that survives, so we know that the grip was about this long. And you have the Brazil nut style of pommel. This pommel is especially good for wrapping the hand around. You can drive it tight up here with the hands. You can leave it down a bit with some space in between. And suddenly you go from a long single-handed sword to a short-handled long sword. And this transition, this, this moment or birth of the long sword in medieval history is something that people get wrapped up around of what date was it, what's the earliest example, and there really isn't one because we have art showing people even with shorter grips beginning to use the sword with both hands like this. The result is the moment the long sword is kind of invented is the first time somebody puts both hands on the sword and says, oh, this gives me an advantage in this particular cut or this particular placement of the sword or the defensive action I'm creating to open up a line of attack. So at any given point, whether it's cut or thrust is oftentimes kind of a very simplistic question to ask in the context that the type of fight, how it's occurring, what the weapons are, what the weapon against it is, what the mindset of the opponents are, those all matter just as much if not more than is this a cut or thrust sword. Uh, the result with this type of sword, and you can see in the illustration here, is one where both hands on there work very, very well and create a situation where this sword suddenly becomes a long sword in hand. 
And so at that moment, whether you're on horseback or on foot fighting, you can get better leverage from the triangular structure of your arms coming to the grip, as opposed to the single-handed sword. You would go back and forth between these. It wouldn't be one or the other in most cases. But here we see that that is what we're talking about when we say this is a good transitional single to two-handed sword in that sense and in that time period. Hope you find that interesting. We look forward to sharing with you more in the future.